Hello, everyone. My name is Ivory Allison, and I am the National Outreach and Education Manager for the American Liver Foundation. And I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. We provide a voice for patients with liver disease and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. I would like to thank Dr. Anne Marie Leah Packets, who will be sharing her expertise on today's webinar. And thank you to Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for the generous support of this webinar. Dr. Leah Packets is an Associate Professor of Medicine in Digestive Diseases and Transplant at Yale School of Medicine and American Liver Foundation Medical Advisory Council member. Dr. Leah Packets, I will give you the floor. Thank you so much, Ivory. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to speak about cirrhosis and uh, specifically clarify the difference between compensated and decompensated cirrhosis and some of the complications that patients may face when they have decompensated liver disease. Sorry, a little uh, fast there on the advance. So first I'm gonna speak to you about the progression of liver disease. There's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding, so I wanna start with some basic definitions. The word hepatitis means inflammation, that's all. And there can be many causes of hepatitis or liver inflammation, but whatever the cause is, if it goes on over time, it leads to scarring in the liver. And the fancy word that we use for scarring is fibrosis. As fibrosis uh, continues, it can progress to the point that normal liver cells become replaced with scar tissue. And when it advances from a little to moderate to a lot of fibrosis, that's when we use the word cirrhosis. So cirrhosis just means a very scarred liver, or um, it's a late stage of non-recoverable fibrosis. So um, a patient may have cirrhosis or a very scarred liver, but it may not be causing them any trouble and they may not actually be aware of it. Um, that's because the liver is still working, able to perform its function and not resulting in any symptoms for the patient. Um, it's important to identify patients who have compensated cirrhosis so that you can try to understand the cause of the liver inflammation and scarring and stop it where it is so that the liver disease does not progress. And it's important to diagnose cirrhosis also because when a person has cirrhosis, there are certain health maintenance measures that we put in place to protect their health. Um, and the ways that somebody may find out that they have cirrhosis could be with liver imaging or if their doctor notes abnormal liver tests that are investigated. Um, we used to bi uh, biopsy people to diagnose cirrhosis, but now we also have other non-invasive tests like specialized types of ultrasound called fibroscan that checks liver stiffness. But what can happen is if the liver disease progresses, then the liver cirrhosis can shift from compensated to decompensated. And the way that I think about that is the liver sort of been tipped over the edge. And now it's scarred, but it's also creating problems for a person. And they may develop signs or symptoms of liver disease, which could be any of the following. They may unfortunately develop a liver cancer. They may have evidence of liver dysfunction or they may develop signs or symptoms of what we call portal hypertension. And I'm going to go into these three things in more detail now. So unfortunately, liver cancer develops more commonly in a scarred liver in the setting of cirrhosis. And so what we put into place is a screening strategy where we recommend that patients have a picture of their liver every six months um, to look to see if any small tumors have developed because if you identify a liver cancer at an early stage, you may be able to offer therapy even to the point of a cure. And so the imaging modalities that we use to take these liver pictures, so to say, may be ultrasound, CAT scan, or MRI. The second thing I mentioned was evidence of liver dysfunction. So this happens when the liver is not able to perform its job 100%. And the liver has a lot of important jobs in the body. One of those is making proteins, uh, specifically a protein called albumin that helps build muscle mass. 
um, and many of the proteins that are involved in blood clotting. So if the liver is not working well, a person may lose muscle mass. They may have a predisposition to bleeding. The liver also makes bile, which is um, stored in the gallbladder and released into the intestines when somebody eats. It acts as a soap, really, to digest fat. And when the liver is sick, the bile may not flow well. A person may become jaundiced with a yellow discoloration and the bilirubin in their blood test will be high. They may also develop low blood sugar and a tendency to more frequent infections because the liver plays a role in the immune system. And we actually have an objective way that we try to measure liver dysfunction. It's called the MELD score or model for end stage liver disease. It's a math formula. You can see the formula on the bottom of the screen and you can Google it. Um, you essentially put in laboratory results, bilirubin, bleeding time or INR because of the reasons that I mentioned. Then also the creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function because sometimes when the liver is so sick, the kidneys get sick as well. And sodium, because when the liver is sick, the uh, person may have problems where they retain more um, salt and water. And this formula then gives you a result. The range is from six um, to a cap of uh, 40. Six is the lowest or the healthiest. So even a person without liver disease will score a six just the way the formula is set up. And 40 is the sickest patient at the top of a liver transplant list. So this is someone who has really significant liver failure. And this is actually the system by which people are placed on a liver transplant waiting list if they've been approved as a transplant candidate because we want the sickest patients to be transplanted sooner. The point at which we think people may do better with a transplant than without is somewhere around 15 but we also see that sometimes patients with lower score may be having a lot of symptoms of liver disease that I'll talk about and may uh, warrant a referral for consideration of liver transplantation. The last of the three potential complications that I mentioned was called portal hypertension. So this means a high blood pressure around the liver and in the abdomen. So the way that I think about it is like a traffic jam. So just imagine you're on the roadway and boom, all of a sudden you come up into traffic. What happens? The cars back up, the roads are congested, and then um, people actually try to find a different route around the traffic. And so this is what's happening in the body when a person has cirrhosis and portal hypertension. A lot of blood has to come from the lower part of the body and the gut through the liver to the heart because things are pumped in a circuit. And when the blood is trying to come into the main vein of the liver, called the portal vein, when the liver is scarred, it creates a sort of traffic jam to that blood, and the liver becomes congested, and the blood backs up into the incoming veins, just the way you would see cars back up into the incoming roadways. And believe it or not, the body can divert some of the blood around this traffic jam and create new roadways or new veins where they otherwise wouldn't be and they may develop in the stomach or their food pipe. And these are called esophageal varices or gastric varices. You may also see a buildup of pressure to the spleen, which is on the other side of the belly. And the spleen tends to consume some of the blood parameters. So you may see low platelet count on the blood work, low white blood cell count, sometimes low red blood cells as well. So we're going to go through some of the complications that can result from portal hypertension. So I mentioned varices. So these are veins um, that may be around the esophagus and the stomach and become enlarged. So these veins shouldn't otherwise be there, but they've formed um, as a way to offload the pressure and they're under tension. And if the veins become very pressurized, they may rupture and bleed. And if a person has bleeding varices, it may present as vomiting blood or sometimes as a black tarry stool, what we call melana, because as blood uh, makes it way, its way through the gut and gets digested, it turns the stool black. Um, bleeding is an emergency that has to be treated right away. But what we try to do is we try to identify varices and take preventative measures so patients don't wind up with a bleeding episode. And so what I'm going to talk about in the next slide is something uh, called endoscopy and banding. 
So this is a picture of an endoscopy. Endoscopy is when you use a tube with a light and camera on the end to look into the mouth and the food pipe or esophagus and into the stomach. So what you see is this is looking down the food pipe, the esophagus, and you see veins that are coming into the center. And um, if those veins are large, what we can do is we can use the scope and place small bands around the veins. Now these bands do what they're supposed to. They are supposed to cause the veins to scar away and then they fall off and a person will pass the bands in their stool, but they're so tiny they may not see them. So usually that um, scarring and time for the bands to fall off is about two to three weeks and a person may be at risk for bleeding on that time if it's ulcer develops. So that's something that we tell people about and ask them to look out for. But this procedure is meant to be done to prevent bleeding. Another thing that we can do is use what we call beta blockers or medications that lower the heart rate and therefore try to lower the tension within those veins and make them less likely to rupture. And some of those medications are called natalol, propanolol, and carvedilol. When we use these, we use them and increase the dose until the pulse rate comes down around 55 or 60, and then we know we've made an impact to protect the patient. So if a person has never bled, you have the option of using the medication or doing the band -Aid. Um, If a person has bled, then you're supposed to do both. And you do the banding every two weeks until the veins are gone, and then you look again at a set interval to make sure that they haven't come back. Another complication of portal hypertension is ascites or fluid buildup in the belly or abdomen. And this is a picture of a CAT scan that shows the liver in the light gray. And then the dark gray with the arrow is the fluid that's developed around the liver, which is called ascites. And this develops as a result of the high pressure and low protein. Sometimes this fluid may become infective. That's called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So what we wanna do is work with patients to control the fluid and also prevent infection. The most important thing is salt restriction. So if you eat salt um, or salty foods, then what happens is water follows and um, eventually you get fluid overloaded and develop ascites in the belly and can develop uh, swelling in the legs. Um, and sometimes you may develop some fluid even in the lung uh, space. So the most important thing is to restrict sodium to less than 2,000 milligrams per day. And so we advise patients to read labels. Some of the things that are highest in sodium are like TV dinners, cold cuts, pickles, chips, pizza, um, things like that. So it's best to avoid. And then we also can use water pills, what we call diuretics, and some of them are listed here. And we use them to help patients urinate out some of the extra fluid, but it's a delicate, ba a delicate balance between improving swelling and avoiding dehydration and damage to the kidneys. So it requires close monitoring with weight checks and lab results. I mentioned that the fluid may sometimes become infected, which is called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Um, this happens because the gut is a bit more leaky in the setting of cirrhosis and portal hypertension and some bacteria may leak into the fluid. Um, the treatment of this is antibiotics and IV albumin, which is a protein given through the IV in the hospital, usually for a period of five days. Um, if a person has developed infection, then we put them on preventative antibiotics um, afterwards, unless they have a reason um, not to. Also, sometimes if we see that the protein in the fluid is very low, we may start someone on antibiotics as a preventative strategy to try to avoid infection in the first place. Sometimes we can't get control over the fluid with medications and we have to drain it out. And what we can do is use a needle to guide a catheter into the abdominal space and drain the fluid out. And then we give albumin protein to try to um, keep the person hydrated and um, to prevent the fluid from coming right back into the abdomen. Um, we can do this for comfort if a person is suffering with a lot of fluid that's tense in their belly. Sometimes we, we take just a small sample to check for infection if we have reason to do that. And then um, if all of this is not working out, if a person is having recurrent bleeding from varices, 
or they're having recurring problems with fluid and we can't get a handle on it, then what we consider um, is something called a TIPS or transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic chunk. That's a mouthful. Um, and our interventional radiology colleagues do this procedure. So what they do is they use a catheter to go into the veins and they create a connection between the portal vein, which is the main vein and its branches going into the liver, and the hepatic vein, which is a main vein exiting and connecting to the vena cava. And this um, shunt reduces that pressure gradient um, and allows for a pathway of less resistance for blood to flow. So that can be helpful to reduce the pressure that's leading to varices or fluid. But unfortunately, it results in more shunting of blood that's not cleansed by the liver and can sometimes result in extra volume to the heart. So if someone has a weak heart, this, this is not a good idea. The liver can tolerate this because it also has an artery that's not shown on this picture, but that's supplying blood to the liver. So you can divert some of the blood from the vein and the liver should still be okay. Um, except in cases where the liver is so sick that this might tip somebody over. So um, it's really a careful to decision to be made by patient and their physician and the interventional radiology whether to go ahead with the tips if other um, measures are not working. And then I'm going to um, mention liver transplant. I do just want to say that there are some other complications of portal hypertension. One of them is called hepatic encephalopathy, which is alteration in a person's thinking. And that's going to be addressed by my colleague in the latter part of this webinar. Another thing is kidney dysfunction um, in the setting of a lot of fluid or ascites buildup, and that will be addressed as well. So I wanna end here by mentioning what are the reasons for a person to be considered for a liver transplant. So if they have cirrhosis and it's progressed to the point that it's decompensated cirrhosis and they have either significant liver dysfunction or complications of portal hypertension that are not easily managed or if they develop a liver cancer at an early stage that may still be cured, these are reasons to be referred for consideration of a transplant. And then of course there are other um, less common indications which are beyond the scope of this webinar today. So I hope that you've learned something um, about the progression of liver disease, some of its complications and how we um, aim to manage them. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I would now like to introduce Dr. Sammy Saab. Dr. Saab is a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and Surgery at the David Geffen School of Medicine. He is also a head of outcomes research in hepatology at the Flager Liver Institute. Dr. Saab is active in many local, national, and international committees, including serving as co-chair on the National Medical Advisory Committee for the American Liver Foundation and he is on the board of directors for the American Liver Foundation. Take it over now, Dr. Saab. Thank you for the, for the very kind invitation. And, and I wanna thank also American Liver Foundation and for you all for participating in, in what I think is a very important talk on, on the signs of liver failure, focusing on hepatic encephalopathy and a Paderwino syndrome. So on my next slide, there it is, uh, where it goes, sorry. Um, so these are objectives in the next 15 minutes or so. We want to first define, you know, what are the signs and, and manifestations and, and natural history uh, of liver failure, um, which we can, which we call hepatic decompensation in medical lingo. Uh, and I also want to look at, in particular, two different types of liver failure. We want to look at hepatic encephalopathy and hepaterenal syndrome. We want to talk about what causes this. Uh, and how are these manifested? And most importantly, how do we treat these two very important complications of liver disease and liver failure? So this is a, a very nice slide. It looks at um, really a, a major milestone. Uh, on the left-hand slide, this left-hand side of the slide, you can see a cirrhotic liver, a liver that's very become very hard, no longer soft like a sponge and very nodular. 
And, and people could have cirrhosis that what we, talk, what we call compensated for many years, which means they've had no overt signs of liver failure. But there is a, a, a red line in the sand where uh, once you pass it, uh, you're now defined as having uh, being someone with liver failure, of having decompensated liver disease. Um, and you see in the circles the different signs of decompensated liver disease, different signs of liver failure. The terms are equivalent. Um, the three principal ones are in the first uh, column, ascites in the green, uh, vomiting blood or varus will be in the purple, uh, and jaundice in, in a very dark uh, purple as well. Jaundice means your eyes being yellow. And if people develop ascites on the first green bubble, if you go across the right, they develop muscle waste we call sarcopenia. And if you go further, they develop hepatic encephalopathy, which means confusion in the setting of cirrhosis. Sarcopenia, you're also at risk of having kidney injury going down. Um, and this is something uh, in, in its extreme form we call um, uh, a renal syndrome. So uh, sometimes liver disease from cirrhosis decompensation can be a very slow process. Uh, I just saw a gentleman that, was, that had alcohol liver disease and suffering 10 years ago, but only now, only now, He's had signs of failure with muscle wasting, water retention, um, and, and confusion, encephalopathy. And other people, it could be as fast as, as a rabbit in the wrapper right corner, um, where people could, people could uh, be diagnosed recently uh, with, uh, with uh, liver disease, and this progresses very fast. Uh, the liver can't take uh, a beating for a long time, years. There's a lot of reserve. It's a big liver. But when it fails, uh, you know, it really fails. So we're going to first talk about hepatic encephalopathy. This is a very uh, frequent, very common problems in liver failure uh, and very, uh, very de debilitating. Um, hepatic encephalopathy occurs in the setting of cirrhosis. And what happens is you have toxins like ammonia and other substances that because cirrhosis, can no longer be filtered by the liver. The liver now becomes hard like a rock instead of soft like a sponge. And so the ammonia, as you see in this slide here, goes around the liver, around the, oops, sorry, around the liver. Let me go back to the original slide. Um, and and um, around the liver. So it goes straight to the brain uh, where it causes confusion. And you see in the bottom here that uh, uh, encephalopathy can occur in 30 or 40% of people with cirrhosis. And the problem is that once you have a bout of encephalopathy, it comes back over and over again. So there are two types of this confusion. The most common one is called overt, which means that, um, that, uh, that people could be confused, don't know who they are, what they're doing, um, uh, and, uh, and being forgetful. Or you can see the bottom row, minimal pack encephalopathy, where, where, where people may not realize they're having problems, they're having trouble adding, subtracting, they're getting, they're getting lost when they're driving, um, they, they have a hard time stopping at stop signs or red lights, or, or, or they fall down. So hepatic encephalopathy, as you see from the next slide, um, can really uh, show itself different ways. Um, you see here on top versus minimal in the covert HE, People have people can be driving, getting driving tickets, or falling down. Um, and in its extreme form, all they're on the right side, they can have a, a be in a coma, or be confused in stage three, uh, or have inappropriate behavior. Uh, so you see here the confusion, it, it, it's really a spectrum. Uh, and it behooves us to pay attention to this um, and to really. Um, be aware that it can manifest itself different ways, um, not just confusion, but even inappropriate behavior. So we see someone uh, in the office with cirrhosis, we ask about confusion, and also we try to enlist our caregivers, um, um, you know, caregivers, and ask them if they notice or have to notice their loved ones or partners or friends or colleagues to be confused many times people may not realize it. 
The treatment, well, there's a number of treatments. The most common ones is a syrup called lactulose. Um, this is um, this is usually taken by mouth several times a day. And we believe it works by flushing out toxins uh, from your from your system. These are toxins that are, that are absorbed might cause a confusion by going straight to the brain. Um, but it is it's it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge because um, if people have a hard time knowing how much to take. If you take too little, you get constipated. If you take too much, you get diarrhea, and that causes a different set of problems. Um, and there are a number of adverse effects like cramping, uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and, and lots and lots of gas. Um, these are some, some physical findings uh, of hepatic encephalopathy, some common ones and less common ones. Uh, the common ones, of course, are the confusion and, and the loss of fine motor skills. So we mentioned lactulose. Um, there's other drugs like rifaximin. This has been around now for, for at least a decade approved in the United States. It's a take twice a day, very well tolerated, um, not much side effects at, at all. Um, it's a pill you take twice a day, um, and, and it helps um, um, it helps uh, prevent any recurrent episodes of hepatic encephalopathy. So it, it, um, many times we may use rifaximin in people um, who, um, despite lactose, still has breakthrough encephalopathy, or we might use it by itself in people who, who are already having two, three bowel movements, um, but still being, uh, being very forgetful. Uh, neomycin medication at the bottom that we don't use anymore. Um, because of concerns of, of, of a number of side effects like um, hearing loss as well as uh, balance problems. So it's best to avoid neomycin. It really has really has no major role today in treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so according, according to guidelines, lactose is a great drug, but really on its own is fairly insufficient. And for that reason, we use a combination of lactose and rifaximin. Going back to some signs of, uh, of manifestations, uh, minimal cephalopathy. So these are things that we need to ask individuals about their work capacity, uh, the quality of life, ability to drive and, and to walk around. So now we're going to turn the table and talk about another major sign of liver failure called a paterrenal syndrome. And we're all we're all are born with two kidneys. These are located in your back. And what happens when you have cirrhosis, um, and the cirrhosis gets to be very, very uh, advanced, your kidneys um, stop working. And the kidneys function, uh, and here defined by blood that's called serum creatinine, is a very important predictor of what happens to you when you have cirrhosis. Uh, and unfortunately, the worse your kidneys are, the worse you will do. So it's critical that we maintain kidney health. Again, this uh, study show that the, the worse your kidneys are doing, uh, the lower is your survival. Uh, and um, so and when it gets to be very, very bad, uh, when your cranning or your kidney function goes up, which means your kidney function is deteriorating, and, you, and your urine output goes down, we worry about a condition called the paterrenal syndrome. This is an extreme form of kidney failure, people with cirrhosis. And unfortunately, it's associated uh, with dying early or needing a dialysis uh, before transplantation or even after liver transplantation. We believe what happens is when you have cirrhosis, uh, your internal pressures go up. That's called port hypertension. That leads to shunt for hepatic encephalopathy. When the when the, you have this port of pretension, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of transformation of bacteria uh, from the gut that goes to the blood system. This leads to um, a lot of vessels inside your body becoming dilated. Um, so the vessels become dilated. Um, there's less perfusion to organs like your kidneys. So your kidneys vessels, um, some of them vessels start clamping down. And that can lead to kind of a functional kidney failure scenario. So people with bad pattern syndrome, unfortunately, it, it does lead to decreased survival. Um, and also, there's a high, high chance um, of going to kidney failure. 
People tend to be hospitalized quite a bit. Um, their quality of life is a bit diminished. And even if they get liver transplantation, if they don't fix it early enough, um, even after liver transplantation, the kidney failure can persist. Um, and after kidney transplant, after liver transplantation, um, their kidney failure may still be present. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of treatments. These tre these treatments are usually reserved. These pharmacologic or medication when people are hospitalized. So people who have Padovino syndrome, the extreme form of kidney failure, this usually results in hospitalization. And when you're hospitalized, there are a number of treatment options. The first thing we do, of course, is to stop the water pills, the diuretics. Um, the second thing we do is um, uh, really try to increase your volume status by giving album fluids. Uh, and if your kidney function does not improve, and that's measured by serum crane. And then we talk about adding something else like minerin or epinephrine. And other parts of the world, like Europe, using telepressin. And, for, and if the kidney function continues to deteriorate um, and the kidney disease progresses, and then you actually might need to be on dialysis um, and, and, uh, and uh, maybe getting closer to liver transplantation. Oops, sorry. So how do we protect the kidneys? Well, sorry. Uh, well, there's a number of things we could do. This is very, very critical. Um, we really try to avoid a class of drugs called non-steroidals. Um, you know these medications as Motrin, Naproxen, Aleve, Advil. You have to avoid them because um, these medications further affect kidney function and cause kidney failure. We also want to avoid a different class of medication called ACE inhibitors. These are sometimes used to protect the kidneys from diabetes, but unfortunately, um, it, it can lead to further demise. Um, when there is signs of, liver, of kidney failure, you want to stop or, 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 or decrease those of diuretics. Diuretics work um, by making you pee more, and they do so by making the kidneys work harder. If they work too hard, the kidneys get tired, and that can lead to kidney failure and hepatobenoid syndrome. Um, that the, there is a there is a tie between um, between uh, the uh, hepatic encephalopathy as well as um, as well as um, as uh, it's a, uh, kidney failure. If you use too much lactose to hepatic encephalopathy, that could cause dehydration and that could also precipitate kidney injury. Let's also talk about about um, stopping certain medications like beta blockers and making sure we maintain an adequate uh, arterial pressure. So whether you have hepatic encephalopathy, whether you have hepatic renal syndrome, these are all occur in the setting of very advanced cirrhosis. And the ultimate therapy um, would be replacing the liver. Um, and so liver transplantation is considered the ultimate therapy um, to treat uh, hepatic encephalopathy and hepatic renal syndrome. There are some things that we could do uh, while waiting for transplantation. I mentioned medication for encephalopathy like lactulose um, and rifaximin. And we mentioned also some steps we could do to protect the kidneys from overuse by avoiding certain medications, um, making sure you keep track of your lactulose, um, and also early recognition um, with flu replacement album uh, infusion can also be a protective. So in conclusion, hepatic decompensation marks a major milestone development in the natural history of cirrhosis. Um, patients are transformed from a compensated condition where people are pretty much, could be even asymptomatic, to a decompensated situation um, where they have signs of failure. Aside encephalopathy and uh, hepatic renal syndrome are just two forms of failure. Talked about other things like ascites, um, vomiting blood, gastrointestinal bleeding, uh, and jaundice. Uh, and early recognition uh, provides opportunity for intervention and improvement outcomes. Um, you know, like everything else, uh, if we identify it early, we can make a major difference in the proof of quality of life um, and their survival as well. Uh, so at this point, uh, I want to thank the organizers for letting me speak today on the signs of failure, particularly hepatic encephalopathy, battery syndrome, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.